my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Stephen Petrini, here for our series. Stephen is a professor and deputy head in the Department of Curriculum Studies. One direction of his research is towards science and technology studies, STS, where he focuses on the history, philosophy, and sociology of education, medicine, and science and technology. This talk this evening is an excerpt from chapter two of the forthcoming book, tentatively titled Education, Medicine, Psychotherapeutics, and Co. from the 1890s to the 1930s. Parts of the chapter will also be published in an upcoming article from the Journal of Medical Humanities. It's recently published on the medicalization of education in various journals, including History of Education Quarterly, History of Psychology, Technology, and Culture. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Petrini. It's great to be here. Thanks to Green College for inviting me, and it's great to be part of the, the principal speaker series. Thanks to you. Here. So thank you for showing up too. I know that this isn't the most conducive weather for a talk on medical liberty, but then again, this is Vancouver, and we have to put up with um, with changes in the weather pretty much daily. So it's good to be here. Thank you. I have a bit of a technology slideshow that's going to go along with. The text. Okay, I'm going to read a bit of text and talk. And since it's not a big crowd, don't um, don't hesitate to interrupt and to ask if if you need clarification on something. Okay, we're going to try to lay out a bit of a narrative on this question of medical liberty. Okay, I want to kind of lay out a narrative that leads us from this question of medical freedom to medical liberty. Okay, and so. Stephen said to me, oh, you know, you do technology, no problem with this stuff. But at the moment, I'm in a historian's mode, and historians and technology just, like, anything can happen. So, so we'll see. Um, basically, what I want to do today is present to you some of the work that I've been doing on medicalization, and specifically on this process of the medicalization of education, okay? But more specifically today, on resistance to this process, okay? So this is a resistance story, a resistance narrative. And I think that's important. It's really important for us, okay? So that we don't see sort of like this process of medicalization. Briefly, um, let's, let's, to simplify things, agree that there are eight sites through which medicine, or through which education is medicalized, okay? One of those sites, historical sites, is intelligence testing. The second site is medical inspections. The third site is physical education and instruction in hygiene or health education. The fourth site is school lunches or dietetics. The fifth site, the hygiene and instruction, or basically how to eat. How to how to think, for sure. Sixth site, school sanitation. The seventh site, clinical psychology. And the eighth site, the ideology of the nervous child and the dissection. Okay, human dissection. Now, in the 1890s, Peter. I'm going to respond to your invitation. You can tell me okay. this is inappropriate okay. this early in the talk. But You've given us some sites for medicalization, but you have given us a definition for, for medicalization. Is yeah. Well, let's just, let's, just, let's just say that for a working definition, is the process of rendering non-medical problems into medical problems. And for me, I'm interested in the historical process of how that happens. Okay? So that's, that's sort of a working definition, and, it, and I think um, it's a, it's a um, fair enough question here. So, What's happening here then in the 1890s and the, and the 1900s is the development and the articulation of a discourse, a discourse on medicalization of education, of course, the medicalization of courts, the med medicalization of the penal system, and so on and so forth, medicalization of the welfare system in many ways. I'm interested in, in, in the way that uh, schools are medicalized. Okay, 
So before I lay out the narrative itself, I want to just get into a little bit of the thesis. Okay? So if you accept for the moment that there is this process going on, this medicalization process, okay, without getting too deeply into that, then, then I'll get on with the, with the narrative of resistance. Documenting an extensive approach to medical intervention and an aggressive subjugation of schooling to allopathic medicine, historians are unclear about options offered to educational practitioners or choices and decisions made among medical practices and philosophies. Okay? And in similar terms, there are very few examples and narratives of resistance to allopathic practices in education. Foucaultian scholars detail the adoption of the examination system in the school, for example, but emphasis on disciplinary power, this is a very good Foucaultian insight, actually, at least for my work, emphasis on disciplinary power falls short in accounting for the liberality inscribed into medical and psychotherapeutic practices. So these Foucaultian histories tend to leave little room for a counter resistance to medicalization. Or indifference itself. Okay? So on one hand, you've got historians of, of alternative medicine and drugless healing, um, such as Byron Porter in the Medical Fringe and the Medical Orthodoxy, such as Robert Johnston in the Politics of Healing, such as um, Susan smith Cooney in Profession of One's Own, or Wharton in Nature Cures. They provide effective counter-narratives to allopathic medicine, allopathic power, but they don't get into education, okay? Just forgetting that site called education is silly being medicalized, at least the 1890s, 1900s. Steve. So, yes, Peter. I'm sorry. In the same kind of question, just, mm -hmm. um, what is allopathic medicine? Is, how, how are you using that term? I'm going to get yes, I'm going to, I'm going to historicize that. Yeah, okay. that's coming. That's a good question. On the other hand, the historiography of medical liberty is a product of allopathic practitioner histories and the AMAs, the American Medical Association, boundary maintenance of cults, frauds, and Austrian property, and pseudo medicine. So, among other things, what I'm arguing is that education, medicine, and psychotherapies offer exemplary sites through which liberty and its dreams are forged. Asylums, clinics, courts, hospitals, prisons, and schools are exemplary sites, somewhat unique, somewhat indistinct, in which allopathic power and medical liberty are co-produced and distributed. Okay, so the point is, there's a co-production going on. The moment you have allopathic power, you've got medical liberty. Okay, they're, two, they're, they're basically co-responsive, co, um, co emergent And we historicize a bit of that. But first I want to, to go back to 1910. And this is when the um, National League in the U.S., the National League for Medical Freedom, the N -M, uh, National NLMF. So it's established on 15 May 1910 in New York City to consolidate campaigns against allopathic medicine and psychotherapeutics and state intervention in hygiene and a monopoly that the American Medical Association seemingly had on individual and public health, announcing the threat on 16 May 1910, the New York Sun referred to the League for Medical Freedom as insurgent healers who have broken away from the regular medical profession. That same day, the League for Medical Freedom membership ads, ran membership ads in all the major newspapers in the U.S. with a large headline asking, Do you want the doctor's trust to be able to force its opinions on you? Do you want government by political doctors? This is in the paper. Do you know that there are five bills before the current Congress which, if passed, could be so used and the concealed purpose of which is to give touch powers to a national department or bureau or office of health? In particular, the Med League for Medical Freedom, or the League, was organized to defeat, defeat the Owen Bill. Legislation moved by Oklahoma Senator Robert Owen and backed by the AMA and Committee of 100 on National Health to centralize the health mandates of five governmental agencies to the tune of about 19 billion a year. So that's, that's 
quite a, quite a um, large budget at the time, right? Among thousands of health bills in state legislatures over the past decade, the Owen Bill intensely galvanized medical freedom with the League testifying at hearings, running newspaper ads, leafleting and pamphleting houses and streets, and organizing public reading gatherings and bathroom meetings. Now this resistance, this is, this is fierce on the street resistance. This is not sort of like an academic theorizing against this notion of allopathic medicine and, um, and allopathic power. It's real, it's real, you know, real populist politics on the street. So for example, yes. Can you go back to the question of what is allopathic medicine? Well, we're getting them in stories like that, yeah. Oh, can you just define it before you start something? Well, the way, let me historicize it, because it's important, because this is, this is a historical, um, it's a historic, historical paper, so it's really important to historicize both this question of medical freedom, rather this isn't an intellectual history, this is more cultural and social. I think she means what is allopathic? I mean, what is it? It's allopathic. Formal medicine. It's formal the orthodox, orthodox medicine. Basically, here's what happens. Um, Samuel Hanneman, in the 1810s, who basically, um, basically creates the system of homeopathy that we're familiar with today. Well, Hanneman, he creates homeopathy, but in, for, in order for him to, to, um, to basically provide a politics of homeopathy, he has to create sort of almost a, um, an oppositional practice, which he calls, he coins in 1810, the word allopathy. Right? So you've got homeopathy here, you've got allopathy here. Unorthodox here, up to the 1910s, orthodox here with, 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 organized, um, with organized scientific medicine. Okay? So just, you know, the working definition is, is uh, sci you know, organized scientific medicine and the orthodox of medicine at the time. Okay? But we're getting to that. Um, so you've got, you've got the Owen Bill going on. Uh, you've got people testifying. This is May of 1910, right? You've got people testifying, such as such as Frank Liston, a professor of the State University of Illinois, Chicago, who's quoted as saying that the outcome of the Owen Bill would be, quote, medical positions of the U.S. government controlled by the machine, medical appointments under the state controlled by the machine. Medical officers in city or county dispensed by the machine. Number and organization of medical colleges and personnel of medical faculties dictated by the machine. Journals which may be published and organizations which we may join controlled by the machine. Things which we may think controlled again by the machine. Now this rhetoric only slightly exaggerates the medico-political demographics of the government at the time. The League concluded that of all 6,253 physicians and health officers now in the employ of government are AMA members or allopathic doctors. So there's a demographic and there's a, there's a response to it. So, so, the, um, so Liston's comments about the control by the machine are not really that far exaggerated in terms of what he's saying as a, um, an orthodox or drug healer. Collective politics of medical freedom and liberty had a long history, generally coincident with European academies and colleges of physicians established to regulate medical practice in the 16th and 17th centuries. Proponents were fond of recalling the medical freedom of Samuel Hanneman, founder of homeopathy, who faced numerous, numerous obstructions to practice in Germany and coined the term allopathy in 1810 to bracket orthodox rational medicine. When the AMA was founded in 1847, one justification was, quote, to draw the line of demarcation between those who are in the profession and those who are not, leaving a range of practitioners, including the homeopaths, politicking for medical freedom. Okay. Now, you see, there's no option but to politic for something called medical freedom at that moment, 1847. More recently, in 1882 and 1885, the New England Anti-Compulsory Vaccination League and the Anti-Vaccination League were formed in resistance to vaccination was made compulsory for school attendance and work in Boston and New York. In 1889, the National Constitutional Liberty League was formed in Boston, exciting the cause of, me of medical freedom, with J. Winfield Scott's The National Liberator uh, 
his his uh, his magazine, the National Liberator, Liberator sort of takes the take, uh, for, sort of forms the first um, politics and discourse around medical freedom. Well, there's a bit of that um, that needs to be explained a little bit more. So Scott's after this genre of medical journalism underwrote numerous medical freedom and liberty port periodicals to follow. As editor of the Arena and 20th Century Mag Magazine, the founder and president of the League, Leo Flower, had a track record of ensuring that medical freedom was public and social. Accustomed to a family tradition of anti-slavery and women right, women's rights campaigning and, and political radicalism, Flower moved from rural Illinois to Boston in 1882 at the age of 22. He helped found the American Psychic Society, and in The Menace of the Medical Mon Monopoly, which he writes in 1894, he anticipated the League's platform, basic, basing religious and medical liberty on the same premise. Now this is important. Where the right to liberty of choice in things pertaining to religion, or the soul's welfare, and matters relating to the individual convictions and desires as they pertain to the human heart or the well-being of the body. Now, this, this is reiterated time and time again for a number of decades. Medical liberty on the same basis as religious liberty. Okay? Flower boasted that in less than two years, the League enrolled in its membership over 200,000 citizens, embracing several thousand educated physicians and men and women prominent in almost every walk of life. The alarm was sounded, he said, to the homeopaths, to the eclectics, to the osteopaths, to the Christian scientists and other schools of healing, Ayurveda, chiropractic, faith healing, herbal folk medicine, naturopathy. Enrollments and funds poured in by the tens of thousands, and five million leaflets and pamphlets were mailed out from the New York office alone. Over 500 men and women were on the speaker's bureau, delivering talks and lectures without salary or pay. Branch offices established in 32 states were especially active in California, Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Massachusetts, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. At this time in the U.S., there were approximately 28,300 drugless healers compared to 40,000 AMA members. About 17.6 million individuals from a total population of 7 million in the U.S. employed drugless healing. 5 million families of 16 million subscribe to the regular medicine. Jim, did you have a question? What? No, okay, sorry. It is Jim. Well, okay, sorry. Yeah. The leak proved to be the first real test of the AMA's propaganda for reform department, established in 1806, to track, document, and compile detailed reports on the movements of suspected detractors from allopathic medicine. An outgrowth of the AMA's Council on Pharmacy and Chemistry, the propaganda department was a surveillance machine, encouraging networks of physicians to infiltrate and report back on the forces of evil emanating from the nostrums, patent medicines, and quacks. The propaganda department director, Arthur, Cr Arthur Crown, routinely discredited the detractors via the Journal of the AMA, or the JAMA, beginning in 1907, and through a variety of, of other mechanisms and ventures. A few years prior to receiving his MD in 1906, his three-year-old daughter passed away by what he judged to be questionable therapy, and his turn to quack busting apparently came easy. Cramp and the propaganda department zeroed in on patent and proprietary medicines, which at the time in 1910 is a $100 million industry. Basically, it's about 53% of all drug sales in the U.S., a massive industry. But, however, the AMA has mixed relationships with the patent med medicine industry. Okay, this is important. Many practitioners were in the habit of compounding proprietary formulas or prescribing and selling patent and proprietary drugs. The AMA nevertheless, nevertheless has to work to link the lead with the patent medicine industry, right? Which is basically getting getting flat from all um, all areas. So the, the, the press is 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 because a lot of the ads are being placed in the newspapers, right? The press is sort of receiving some flat in terms of like, well, if you're advertising the, the patent drugs, you're complicit. So the patent drugs are sort of being at that moment defamed big time, even though the doctors, the, the, the allopathic physicians are are complicit. 
Um, but by 19, the crowd in 1910 is positioning in the propaganda department to expose any opposition to the Owen Bill as fraudulent property. And on 18 May 1910, the Senate hearings, uh, the eve of the Senate hearings on the bill, the New York Times kick, kicks off the campaign to defame the League for Medical Freedom with medical freedom as a headline. And they say the makers of patent medicines, adulterers of drugs, and practitioners of the cults of mental and osteopathic healing are up in arms. The Times begins, they have persuaded a few well-intentioned but misled individuals to join them, okay, and inform the need for medical freedom to oppose practically all the reputable physicians in the country. License they mean, the Times concludes, when in liberty they cry. Okay? Now, science republishes the Times editorial in, 19, in June 1910, while Cramp and the, and, uh, while and the, and the, and the JAMA editor, Morris Fishbine, worked to defame the, the League monthly between June and August in the JAMA. American Medicine, a journal and independent, an arm independent yet in service of the AMA, came to the assistance it's Kennedy Association's defense against the League for Medical Freedom. It's a shame, a miserable shame, American Medical says, American Medicine says, that the AMA should be forced to make any defense at all against an unjust and unwarranted, 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 unwarranted attack as that of the NL, as the League for Medical Freedom. In defense of the doctors, American Medicine claimed that allopathy is a misnomer. For today, there is no such school, nor are there any physicians who care to be dubbed LPS. For years, the JAMA constructed this order of neutrality around scientific medicine, insisting, quote, regular physicians belong to no school of medicine. They are thus differentiated from those who hold certain tenets. They, that they are not allopaths, that in fact there is no allopathic school need perennially insisted on it. Belief for medical freedom associated the regular or allopathic doctors with orthodox medicine in the way that one might asso associate um, the orthodoxy in, way, in, way, in ways that one might describe the orthodoxy in religion. Okay? So the AMA is trying to def deny that there's an allopathic you know, school or sect of medicine. But at the same time, trying to defame these other practitioners, okay? Now, in the middle of the open procedures, just for, for clarification, okay? Your, it's, it's your argument that orthodoxy in religion is, is, is the same thing as no, subscribing no. to scientific medicine. No, that's the League for Medical else. Freedom's argument. Okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's the League for Medical Freedom's argument. That's the definition of orthodoxy, but it's also what they're doing is comparing. The orthodoxy in religion with the orthodoxy in medicine. Fair enough comparison given medical, medical freedom on one hand and religious freedom on the other hand. So you are saying that. I'm saying what I'm doing is 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 reiterating what the League for Medical Freedom is saying with that comparison. Yeah. I'm reiterating that. I'm quoting the League for yeah, Medical orthodoxy. Freedom and making that comparison. Yes. Is that clarified? Yeah, I, I don't understand whether this is your position or whether this you, you are simply reporting the. Position. I'm describing this. Is, this is historical narrative. At this point. I see. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have problems with position at all in terms of um, at, at that moment in time what's happening in terms of the discourses, right? In terms of that comparison of religious orthodoxy with medical orthodoxy over here. Yeah, <clears throat> that's yeah. So it is your argument. That is the politics of the day. What I'm going to do is, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so in the middle of the Owen proceedings in June 1910, the Carnegie Foundation delivered copies of Abraham Fletcher's report titled Medical Education in the United States and Canada to all the medical schools, Fletcher's, Fletcher's surveys, and the politicians, news media, etc. Now, historians generally concur that the Fletcher report was a bombshell that rattled medical and political forces throughout the country with its expose of the miserable standards obtaining in most, most orthodox medical schools. 
Among the 168 medical schools visited and summarized by Flexner were 32 irregular and unorthodox institutions, or what Flexner marginalizes as the medical sects, sects at, or works. He begins his description of these schools by asking whether in this era of scientific medicine, sectarian medicine is logically defensible. Whether, while it exists, separate standards fixed by the conditions under which it can survive are justifiable. And then he goes on, there can be no limit to the number of dissenting sets. As a matter of fact, only three or four are entitled to serious notice in educational discussion. Now he says the chiropractics, the mechanotherapists, and several others are not medical sectarians though exceedingly desirous of masquerading as such. They are unconscionable medical quacks, he says. The New York, New York Times covers the story of the front page headline, factories for the making of ignorant doctors, and, and emphasizes Flexner's recommendations to shut schools down and drastically reduce the number of medical graduates in competition among the physicians. Reckless overproduction of cheap, of cheap doctors has resulted in, in general overcrowding the time breaks. Flexner, Flexner writes matter-of-factly, it appears then that the country needs fewer and better doctors, and that the way to get the better is to produce fewer. A trend is well underway at this point, and fueled by the AMA's Council of Medical Education, discussed <coughs> in 1904. So by 1921, the number of medical schools in the U.S. is actually reduced to 85, and the number of graduates are cut nearly in half, and only four homeopathic schools remain. Boston University is actually transformed from homeopathic to allopathic in that process following Flexner by 1921. The AMA seals its power over accreditation and licensing in 1912 when the Federation of State Medical Boards accepts its medical school rating system. At the same time, osteopath Ira Collins loses his appeal that the state of Texas abridges his freedom to practice or violates his 14th Amendment, Amendment rights. Establishing an allopathic medical licensing board unsympathetic to healers such as himself. Practitioners who could not meet the licensing board's approval could be fined or imprisoned. The Supreme Court reviews the case, he appeals. They affirm the AMA's power of the licensing by deciding unanimously in 19, February 1912 against Collins and rules that medical practitioners, you can imagine, this is the Supreme Court telling telling the um, willing for the country what it is that counts as medical practice and what doesn't. The Supreme Court says that medical practitioners must begin with a diagnosis, period. For general medical practice, quote, science is needed. The Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundation, the philanthropic power behind the Flexner Report, networked with the AMA to provide over 600 million to about 25 select allopathic institutions, basically directing them the course of medical education afterwards. That history is well written. Peter himself has done some work in that, in that area of philanthropic um, power and effects of um, related to education. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. Yeah. On October 24, 1911, a massive demonstration is organized by the League for Medical Freedom in New York City to champion medical freedom and generally celebrate a groundswell of support defeating the Owen Bill. A New York American reporter describes the scene this way. He says, this is at uh, Carnegie Hall, right? Very large enthusiastic mass meeting was held last night in Carnegie Hall to protest against compulsory medicine in general and the so-called all of Owen Bill in particular. The audience was an especially intelligent and had a large percentage of women in it. The noted homeopath Lewis Crutcher stands up, stood up in front of the crowd, reported that in the Owen Bill proceedings, bogus claims were made about medical progress. The bill's proponents, for example, claimed that with a centralization, central department, 600,000 people would be saved from death, and 3 million would be saved from sick beds each year. Crutcher asked why this could not be done, of course, without centralized political bureaucracy. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, so these meetings continue, right? And um, through New York, across across uh, Chicago, Flower goes to the Ladies Literary Club in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
And um, now he's, you know, they're out there defending these, these um, alternative or unorthodox or drugless healers, unorthodox practitioners of drugless healers. So here's Flower in, in, in 1912. But the Owen Bill is pretty much defeated at this point. The League for Medical Freedom pretty much does their job. And, and no one really believes the Owen Bill is going to be pass. But still, running through proceedings within Congress, and you can imagine for two years, it's bill after bill after bill trying to get through. Um, so here's Fowler in 1912 at the, at the uh, Ladies' Literary Club. In America under liberty, homeopathy has become a real power in the medical world, notwithstanding the continued efforts of the old school to hamper and cripple it. Eclecticism has also arisen in our midst under comparative freedom, yet it has had to battle for its life on account of the intolerance which has, ever, which has ever striven to hamper when it could not outlaw its practitioner. Now the same is true of osteopathy, Christian science, he says, and all other systems of cure that, throughout, that through their success in the treatment of the sick have aroused fierce opposition of the dominant school. Okay? Now invariably, okay, slip through some of the series of slides here. Now invariably, what happens here, of course, after those series of, of meetings in Chicago and, and in, at Carnegie Hall, the, the journals start to, you know, they're trying to appeal to the crowd. The Carnegie Hall, Hall reporter is saying, well, mostly women in the crowd, what's going on here? So he's activating Ramanan by the AMA that looks something like this, trying to again tarnish the lead for medical freedom with this patent med medicine industry. And so you see a lot of these things at the, at the moment. Now, so. Let's, let's address this question of medical progress, because it's really important for the argument. Um, so, while medical sociologists debated whether medical progress was due to public health or clinical and laboratory practice, the League for Medical Freedom disregarded the progress narrative altogether. Okay? For example, the League for Medical Freedom dismissed medical inspections in the schools begun in 1894 as regressive or irrelevant at best. Over, 15, over a 15 year period of inspections, despite bold claims and hopes, contagious diseases and resultant deaths increased in Chicago and New York, where the medical inspections are going on in the schools. Okay? The data are a bit mixed in Boston, where physicians reported decreased in cases of contagious diseases detected in the schools between 1894 and 1908. However, once the nurses were employed to do the work to assist with these inspections in 1907, the cases actually increased. Okay? Diphtheria and scarlet fever cases reported by the doctors conducting school inspections did not exceed 77 and 31 respectively in any of the years between 1894 and 1907. Um, however, the nurses, now when, when they're reported, they report 392 cases of diphtheria and 407 cases of scarlet fever for 1907 alone. Right? So, if we listen to appeals for medical freedom, one of the AMA practitioners continues in a debate with B.O. Fowler in 1913. We should limit the possibility of medical progress, he says. The debate was prefaced with a, connect, with a comment by a physician proclaiming that, um, quote, it is with indignation that one hears the rank and file of this noble profession pillory as the doctor's trust. Given the mixed results, an apparent dominance of and favoritism toward the medical trust across the educational system, the League for Medical Freedom was alarmed by the pace of which allopathic medical inspectors were deployed. Okay, so there's, this is the this is classic scene of um, medical inspection going on. Doctors actually check the vaccination marks. The yeah, city of city classroom. Um, so, so the League for Medical Freedom is basically saying, well, if there's no evidence that these inspections are actually working, why are they proliferating across numerous cities in the U.S.? And this is the trend of 
compulsory medical inspections across the U.S. to 1911, 1940 to 1911, trend that more or less continues. Um, Boston is the first city in the U.S. to systematically implement medical inspections, beginning on November 1st, 1894. The practice is made compulsory across Massachusetts in 1906. Superintendent of Boston Schools reports in 1908 that human officers encountered opposition from teachers. This is the first mention, at least that I know of, of the medicalization of education. The superintendent of Boston Schools is reporting that his offices, officers are encountering, are, are encountering fierce, quote, opposition from teachers who fear that pedagogy was to be medicalized. Fearing opposition from parents who resented any usurpation <coughs> of authority. From physicians who feared that their private practice might be invaded. And from certain members of the public at large who saw the dangers of paternalism in the movement. Yet despite these misgivings, cities in the U.S. implementing medical inspection in schools increased to 411 by 1911. Seven states have compulsory laws, like Massachusetts, and other states, another 12 states have somewhat more permissive laws. But the cities are still implementing the, the inspections. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me do, do a little bit on, on, so now we're in the schools, right? So medical inspections are going on, it's, you know, it's our scene here. Uh, okay, so here's what's going on. The leak for medical of freedom channels anti-vaccination anti and anti-vivisection. A lot of the anti-vaccinationists and the anti-vivisectionists are joining up with the League of Medical Freedom, right? And they're channeling this energy into alliances and politicking against allopathic medical progress in cities such as Boston, Chicago, and New York. Now, they're up in Ottawa, too, and things are going on in Windsor as well in Canada. For example, in Chicago, on 29 May 1912, Richard Luton, is sent home from his public school after a diagnosis of ringworm by a medical inspector. inspector. The physician instructs the eight-year-old boy's mother in a written message to put iodine on the facial marks and get further treatment for the contagious disease, proof of which would be necessary for returning to school. Mrs. Luton was, a, was advised by the League for Medical Freedom, however, she goes, she's not a member of the League, goes to the League's offices in Chicago, What's going on here? They tell her to get a second opinion. So she goes to a private physician who concludes that the boy doesn't have reborn. And it's a diagnosis that's also made by the boy's father, who's a homeopath. So now they send the kid back to school. It's on 3 June. The principal then sends him back out. We send him to the medical inspector who sends the kid home, according to Section 110 of the rules of the Chicago School Board. Now, it's getting a bit much, so on 5 June, then the League for Medical Freedom sends their, their lawyer in, right? Jay Sheridan. He meets with the Chicago Commissioner of Health and Physician, George Young, and reminds him of the liberties neglected in the Luton case. Kids should be in school. Annoyed with the complaint, Young, however, the Commissioner moves to basically throw Sheridan out of his office. The next day, the boy, however, is re readmitted into school on advice from the Commissioner. But on 12 June, lo and behold, the Board of Education passes an order requiring that all students to submit an examination blank filled out by a physician at the start of the next school year. And as the League for Medical Freedom notes at the time, quote, the Board makes the physician of Chicago, gives the, the physicians of Chicago a present of 300,000 patients on September 3rd. Yeah, it's at that point. Um, Hardcore politics at that point in terms of what offices they're walking into, whether the kids are walking into the homeopath's office or the Elkath's office. So there's a lot at stake here. Um, let me skip a little bit, a little bit here, about five minutes or so. So, so Flower, this is this is a good question. You know, there is there's that first question of medical progress. Which is basically, if there's medical progress at all, if you're accepting it, is it due to public health, you know, good old sanitation engineering, or is it due to clinical medicine, clinical and scientific medicine? That's the core 
of the debate for a lot of this around medical progress, okay? And then there's also the other side of it, which is, you know, at some moment, um, the allopathic doctors are accused of running around treating individuals rather than paying attention to the social system where you have poverty rampant in a lot of these, these tenements in these cities, Chicago, New York, Boston, so on and so forth. So let me um, read a little bit of flower. This is, uh, this is, um, this is kind of a classic flower here. Um, flower calls compulsory medical uh, examination to treatment the palliative makeshifts of capitalist political economy. Pope, he says, they serve to divert the public mind from great economic wrongs that are the root causes of the evils, such as involuntary poverty, quoting in here, involuntary poverty, child labor, the disease breeding and overcrowded tenements, the sweatshops and other unnecessary evils, evils that would not be possible under just economic conditions, are major factors in the stunted and benumbed brains and physically defective bodies of an army of little ones today. I mean, they're just not getting the nutrition they need. It's not a case of, um, of um, again, it's a, it's a, it, you know, is it social, social medicine or is it um, clinical medicine they need? So poignantly, he links the, quote, political doctors to a, quote, privilege-seeking class, quote, coining money out of the working poor. And he goes on and says, the parents and ancestors of these kids have long been the victims of social injustice. Reinforced by our evil economic conditions. Much of this is doubtless due to inherited weakness, as he says. So the deal is that medical freedom is personal, of course, as much as it's a, a medical political achievement, right? And so, um, so what happens here, you've got the AMA propaganda department going out, and this is a surveillance machine. And I'm, I'm sitting here right now. You know, I can't believe it's the 29th of January, but I'm in 2008, but I'm sitting here right now as a historian saying, thank goodness for that surveillance machine. Because what they do, what that propaganda machine does, is basically, they're going out and they're pulling pamphlets that are tabbed on to their, you know, pamphlets are going out into the mail, through the mail system. Um, posters are being tabbed on to the, to the um, telephone poles. Um, Letters are being sent out to the parents and things like that. Was, and, you know, there's meetings and things like that. There's Carnegie Hall meetings. And um, Kramp and company in the propaganda department, they're basically gathering up everything they can get their hands on and they're archiving it just perfectly for historians of the future. So when you go to the AMA archives, they've got their, their alternative medicine and, um, and uh, Quackery Alternative Medicine Archive, and everything is there from, from basically 19, um, well, pretty much from the late 1890s on. So they go back in time and they collect a lot of things too. So, the need for medical freedom defeats the old mill, basically <coughs> reduces. A little bit more too? Yeah, okay. But, yeah, I'll just, just a little bit more. Then I'll theorize a little bit too, but just a little bit more than Eric's here, because it's part of it. That. You know, you've got to go, you've got to, like, to historicize this, this question of, of, of medical liberty. You know, a lot of these, is, this is a lot of the, uh, uh, these are a lot of the illustrations within um, the National League's um, publication. Okay, so 19, early 19, 1911, 12, 13. Just trying to be fine. <coughs> So, okay, so the League for Medical Freedom does its thing. They think, well, we've done enough. Flower just disappears. Um, he's got other problems going on. So in 1918, lo and behold, um, there's still work to be done. You know, it's not the Owen Bill. That's all been, been defeated. But the Congress and, of course, the AMA is still, is still doing the political work. And uh, so Laura Little comes along. So she starts this thing called the American Medical Liberty League. So now there's a shift from medical freedom to medical liberty. You know, kind of different discourses, but same same histories. We're trying to historicize those differences a little bit. Um, and little, she has a, a similar problem to Cramp. Now Cramp's son, of course, dies at the hands of what he says are drugless healers. Laura Little's 
boy, he dies at the hands of what little says are the allopathic healers. So, so you've got this this sort of almost fierce passion, you know, with these with these people. So she's doing a whole lot of work around anti-vivisection, along with with Diana Belay, huge leader, political leader in the anti-vivisection league. Um, amazing stuff that she's doing, um, trying to basically to to resolve problems of of experimental. Um, Scientific and experimental medicine on um, basically you know kids who are um, who are institutionalized in a lot of the boarding schools, right? So she's off she's off trying to undermine all of that work. She teams up with Laura Little, who's doing work around anti vaccination, right? And, uh, and they team up and they start the, the American League for Medical Freedom. Um, and it's not long, right? Um, before they're they're moving into they're moving into um, especially south of Chicago, so, so they they ship Leaf Medical Freedom in Boston, American Medical Liberty. They get headquarters basically right in the shadows of the AMA in Chicago, and they're at the, the Illinois Legislature, and they're basically in 1919 they've got they've got Lang, they've got a bill in the state legislature to institute institute into the Constitution the Illinois Constitution. A medical liberty clause. Okay, pretty amazing stuff that you can imagine all the way. Now it gets defeated closely, but nonetheless, <coughs> it's there. Okay, um, that's the clause itself. But let's let's skip on. So, so okay. So where does this come from? Now, little in 1919, she publishes the baby and the medical machine. Where she speaks directly to women. She's asking, quote, how long are they are the wily medical grafters to control the women's clubs of the country to further their ends? She says, a doctor is always the doctor. And the doctor cannot forget that he is a doctor when he comes to health cancer. He proceeds to doctor the whole community. Um, the medical liberty recognizes this as medicalization, and again, this is historicizing this kind of. Foucault starts to use the quite the notion of medicalization, which I'll get to shortly and quickly and then we're done. Um, but this is this is in the 1920s. They begin to talk about this process of medicalizing medicalizing the schools, right? They recognize it as a process of, med of medicalization, and um, and basically configure then the AMA into quote an autocratic optical. His tentacles are ever reaching out for more power, more money, more laws for the octopus and against the people. Now, confidence in the AMA, the Alcast medicalization, was eroded and shaken throughout the 1920s, despite the extensive breach of, of the medical octopus. Um, a lot of people are still subscribing to the, to the, to the drug as healers. Um, still a debate over social medicine or sanitation versus uh, public health versus uh, clinical medicine. AMA in 1923 is trying to figure figure things out. You've got um, you've got what you have is a decrease in the mortality rates. Okay, so there is a decrease, and the, the American League for Medical Liberty is, is acknowledging these decreases in mortality rates. Right, Chicago, Boston, New York, San Francisco. Okay, however, within that, you've got mortality rates by these contagious diseases. However, what's going up are deaths by pneumonia and deaths by accidents, okay? And so it's a public health question again in terms of how you explain away this decline of, of accidents. So what you have, and this is, this is a big problem for the AMA, they can't, they, they can't resolve it. You've got 489,583 AMA doctors involved in curative medicine, doctors, dentists, nurses, so on and so forth, right? Um, not all, of course, AMA, the nurses and the dentists, but, um, and you only have 17,000 involved in preventive medicine. So, so it's kind of, so the public health is only 17,000. Preventive clinical medicine is up there at 17,000. The nurses are sometimes falling in between. Okay. Um, so basically, um, Little dies in, in um, 1931, and basically the medical, the American Medical Liberty League dies with it. Somehow, there's still pamphlets trickling out to people. You know, the physicians are receiving these pamphlets from the American Medical Liberty League. 
even up to 1958. But really, there's nothing called the League anymore. And what's, what happens in, of course, when you have the, it's the rise of the American Civil Liberties League on one hand, and then the American liberty, not to be confused with either, either civil liberty or medical liberty, in the 1930s, you have the American Liberty League. So liberties on one hand are civil liberties for everyday people with the ACLU. And on the other hand, you've got, um, you've got the, the American Liberty the, the defending the property rights of the DuPonts of the, and, um, and big business of the world. So let me just theorize, well, yeah, let's just stop. I'm going to theorize a little bit. We can couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. He could come out in the couple minutes. Five. Couple minutes. Couple minutes. Because um, this again is about a, this is heavily relying on Foucault. Let me just do a little kind of Foucault work here because it's important. Might be difficult to follow. If you want the paper, I'll email it to you in the chapter. No problem. It's basically so just tweaking a few little things. But okay, but I'm, I'm more I'm more interested in, in um, Foucault's work in the birth of the clinic than discipline and punish. Okay. So that's your, that's your difference here between um, disciplinary power and what Foucault names in, in um, the birth of the clinic as um, liberality. Okay. So there's these contradictory things happening within medicine. And Foucault now you know, he's doing the, the birth of the clinic, of course, in the 1960s. So back in the, he goes back, he's back now in the late 18th, late 18th time, century. And he's looking forward, okay? He's theorizing forward. And he says, the two dreams, he explains, two dreams, he explains, of medicine are isomorphic. The first expresses in a very positive way the strict, militant, dogmatic medicalization of society by way of a quasi-religious conversion and the establishment of a therapeutic clergy. The second dream of medicine expresses the same medicalization, but in a, tri in, a triumphant, in a triumphant negative way. That is to say, the elimination of disease in a corrected, organized, and ceaseless, ceaselessly supervised environment in which medicine itself would finally disappear, together with its object and its raison death. However, he warns, quote, we must not be misled by the manifest contradiction of clinical medicine and social medicine, free and individualizing on one hand, and moral and normalizing on the other hand. The problem of health, he says, quote, in the liberated domain of the democratic state is a problem of medicine and liberty, okay? Foucault recognizes that under economic and political liberalism, public health and clinical medicine acquire unique problems of governmentality. Now here's, I, I think something for us to just end here and something for us to think about, but he says, can medicine, be a free profession that is protected by no corporative law, no prohibition of practice, no privilege of qualification. Can the medical consciousness of a nation be as spontaneous as its civic or moral consciousness? And so, okay, sorry about going over time, but thank you so much for. Uh,